So um, let me start with uh, kind of our vision, right? For, for especially for those who may need a refresher on Zerto or are new to Zerto. Our vision is pretty simple. We want to enable an uninterrupted world for all of our technology users, consumers, and businesses. And that's, uh, that's a lot, you know, and where do we play our part? Uh, as businesses are transforming, um, bringing their services to be more in, uninterrupted, and when and if an interruption happens, we want to be able to help resume that quickly, and in a lot of cases, hopefully avoid that interruption. And how we deliver that is via our IT resilience platform. It, it's really built on three kind of core technical principles. Um, one is it's, very, it's continuous in nature. So the, the core of our technology is a continuous journaling technology that basically extracts data, moves data, manipulates data, but it's based on a continuous stream. The second part is enterprise scale. Anything that we do, we want it to be scalable, not only for the small and medium business, but also through the largest of enterprises. And the third is simplicity. We want to make it extremely simple to do a lot of complicated tasks, especially when you're talking about resilience, it, it does become very complicated. We want to make the complicated very simple and very well known in the industry for that. Now the IT resilience platform, we look at it um, horizontally or broadly covering private clouds that are being built, public clouds, um, with a very large base of managed service providers that use us as the underlying platform, as well as extending into next generation application architectures, whether it be PaaS, SaaS, which I'll get into. So this is, this is our core platform and what it's built around. So let me uh, dive a level deeper. And uh, before I do that, I want to take a step back and really talk about resilience. When we break down what an IT provider has to provide back to the business in terms of resilience, the lowest common denominator comes to four basic things. Um, one, we want to be able to restore data from a recent copy that could be minutes or days old. And that's usually within the four walls of the data center or four walls of the cloud, however you wanna kind of think about it. But it's, it's the, the act of recovering data to a point in time without having to declare a disaster. The second re resilience challenge or goal out there for most ID providers is being able to recover from that disaster event. So this could be an entire site-wide, but usually talking about some sort of a failure that causes the, the IT provider to, to switch over to an alternate site or to cloud and provide those services from somewhere else, traditionally our traditional DR. The uh, third um, goal is really to help keep the regulators happy. You know, those, those, those SLAs that were written years and years ago that said thou must retain data for X number of years, or in some cases, um, not just internal SAs, but also regulatory SLAs, they want to be able to retain that data and keep those regulators happy so that when that data is needed, they can, they can provide that data. The fourth, uh, which falls into a, a resilience category, is really the, the movement of applications and data without disruption. So we talked about uh, private cloud, public cloud, moving to SaaS and PaaS platforms, being able to move that data across, not being limited to one architecture. So these are kind of the four lowest common denominator items we see um, that IT providers want to be able to provide. And obviously, um, want to be able to do that quickly. You want to be able to do that efficiently, both from a resource standpoint and also a cost standpoint, and also make it easy, both from an on-prem and from a cloud perspective. So when we break our IT resilience down, uh, platform down with these goals in mind, there are five core services that we're able to provide out of that. First is disaster recovery. Uh, that's the act of moving from location A to location B, could be on-prem, could be across cloud. Operational recovery. So this is the, the act of being able to recover those data points we talked about. Could be VMs, could be files, could be applications, databases, et cetera, from what I call localized logical disasters. Those disasters that happen every day inside a data center, you don't hear about them, but when you do run a report of the number of restores that happened in the last week, that's what we consider operational recovery. Long-term retention is the keep it, keep it for a period of time in order to meet, meet SLAs. Hopefully you never have to recover from it, but 
uh, if there's a legal issue or if there's a, a regulatory issue, you can bring that data back. From a hybrid cloud and multi-cloud mobility, it's not only performing these functionalities within the, the traditional um, on-prem cloud with, uh, with VMs, but also extending it into a uh, public cloud and to and from and across and back and forth and all the different combinations that customers want to do today. And the last is operational services. So this is nothing more than using a copy of, um, uh, of production for alternate uh, reasons. So for example, maybe uh, you've had a ransomware hit and you've hired a forensic company to come and do research and you want to stand up a, a bubbled environment where they can uh, go to town with their tools and try to figure out you know, what happened, piece that together. Or you want to refresh a non-production environment. So we call that operational services, being able to stand those additional um, environments to continue with operations. So this is these are the kind of four uh, five technical areas that we focus on um, with the IT resilience platform. So I've broken today's uh, uh, talk into two two categories. First, since we haven't talked since uh, uh, almost uh, since almost about a year now, I wanted to give you a quick recap of. Um, everything that we've accomplished with Zerto 7 in 2019. We had two major releases in uh, 2019 and a lot of features that uh, um, new customers may appreciate and, and some of our um, revered old customers are going to say, wow, you know, I, that would make my life a, a heck of a lot easier. So I'm going to run through um, all of the enhancements and rather than, you know, the traditional one per slide, type of thing, I've really condensed these down and I'm just gonna hit the high points. In the second half of this, I wanna talk through um, how customers are using Zerto and how our use cases along those five key areas have evolved and give you, give you, uh, give you folks an example. So with Zerto 7, um, we enhanced our own resiliency. So as um, IT resilience is becoming core and core to the business, our platform starts taking more of a center stage in terms of its resiliency. So we added a couple of features. One was clustering of the ZVM. The ZVM is our, our control uh, brains or control mechanism for the entire environment. It's where the policies and, and schedules, et cetera, um, live. So we provide clustering at that level in order to make it resilient. So traditionally, we do have much of a vCenter type architecture where you've got a primary and a secondary. If something happens on the primary site, you can always go over to the secondary. But we want, the customers wanted the, the local um, ZVM tightened down, so we introduced clustering at the database level. Um, we introduced uh, what we call tolerant failover. So sometimes what happens um, we have this concept of uh, virtual protection groups, VPGs, think of it as consistency group where a number of VMs can be aggregated together and they will atomically behave as one unit. So think of it a traditional three tier architecture where you have databases, middleware and a front end that need to be kept at the same atomic point in time, especially when you're failing over. Um, and if one VM in that is not behaving uh, properly, that could prevent the entire group from failing over. So via the fault tolerant uh, feature is really an exclusion feature where that one item can be removed. You know, we introduced something which is the reverse, where you could fail over an individual VM if you wanted out of that consistency group, but uh, this kind of takes care of the reverse where that one uh, misbehaving VM will not uh, prevent the entire failover from, from occurring. Uh, evacuate host to, for maintenance and host down. So this is proactively. A lot of, a lot of times, you know, the ESXi hosts may not be failing, but we know we're going to do some maintenance or we know we're going to replace those, uh, those hosts. So by clicking that feature, essentially, we'll drain all of the, the DR, the, the resilience uh, workload and the components that we're running and allow that host to be taken down and then repopulate um, populate that. We provide some UX simplicity um, in there and uh, in the, the platform as well. VPGs are, again, I said it was a consistency group, but as you go into larger and larger environments, um, they would, customers would create one VPG and say, boy, it would be really nice if I could stamp this as a template across multiples. So the simplification would essentially allow us to copy a VPG settings. So you don't have to reset up your environment, especially when you've got one perfectly um, created and you just want to create multiples of, of that. Uh, additional resource management enhancements. So we'll support SDRS on the other side of, uh, of uh, VMware vSphere sites. So um, movements occur, we're not going to break uh, um, break any of the replication on that site. So these were all kind of back-end platform enhancements. One of the other major enhancements, I was super excited about this one in 7, 
was this concept we introduced of the elastic journal. So as I mentioned earlier, we run on a journal-based technology. We're continuous. We're con continuously streaming. And most of our customers are enjoying a five-second RPO. But, um, you know, primary, and, and, and this is living on primary disk capacity. So customers are extending from the default of keeping a 24-hour journal to sometimes going over a weekend because bad stuff may happen over the weekends. They may not catch it. Some even going into um, days and weeks. So the, the idea here was, well, why can't I take a point in time in the journal, let's say my Monday um, night, midnight point in time, and put a retention on that and, and, and keep it on a, a secondary repository, and then repeat that on a daily, on a daily basis. Then when I reach a, a Friday or a Saturday, maintain a, a full or an incremental and, and keep that for a month. When I reach the month end, keep that journal point on that date for a year. So you kind of see what I'm getting at. It's we've got the data, we've already captured it from the, the continuous nature, nature of Zerto. So now we can essentially on the back end uh, retain it for long term. So we may call this long term journal uh, or long term retention. And the combination of the two really introduced this uh, uh, elastic journal concept. But with that, we also needed to integrate with secondary storage. So customers would come and say, hey, I've got some exagrid, or I've got some data domain, or I've got some store ones, or I've got X deduplicated storage in the back end because I'm trying to keep my secondary storage costs low. Can you support that? Yes, of course, out of the gate, we supported both uh, SMB and NFS uh, devices. We added support for a lot of the deduplication engines. Again, as we extend into this beyond what, we, what I'll call the, the short-term journal, the next use case starts becoming well, I want to search for something, and it's been a couple of days, weeks, months, and I don't remember what it was. So could you provide the ability to index and search across that? So we added that capability in 7 as well. And then lastly, make that really simple for me. So allow me to either go in by date, by VM name, or uh, by file, and actually look a search for what I'm looking for, and then give me an easy way in order to pull that uh, back, whether or not it's out of the long-term or the short-term journal. So we added that unified uh, single recovery flow. So really, we're capturing the data at a uh, micro interval, but we're able to keep it at a macro interval for a number of years. And this was a, uh, a real uh, shift in thinking by combining both uh, uh, disaster recovery and long-term retention. Uh, security is obviously top of mind. So for the cloud platform, especially uh, being able to integrate with uh, uh, Azure Ma uh, AD managed identities, IAM on the AWS side, um, uh, encryption at, at rest, and also uh, FIPS support. So there's ransomware, not only recovering from ransomware, which we provide for a lot of customers, but also being able to uh, be ourselves in in a secured environment was absolutely critical for uh, for a lot of customers. So we enhance security, and that's a theme that you're going to see continue across a lot of uh, a lot of our future releases. Cloud, probably the most exciting area um, in terms of uh, new enhancements. Um, so, for example, with uh, with Azure, and again, these are just selected highlights. With Azure, um, one of the, the, the big, big questions we get from a lot of cloud customers was, I'm used to a certain le a service level um, on-prem. I'm used to a couple of seconds of RPO and failing over in, uh, in three or four minutes. I moved to cloud and everything just kind of slowed down. It takes me a lot longer to be able to perform a lot of those operations because of the conversions uh, associated and we have to obviously live in the context of uh, what the cloud platform provides. With uh, Azure skill sets, what we were able to do is essentially scale out the Zerto components. So the ZCA, which is a Zerto component that lives in cloud, receives all the all of the uh, data from an on-prem environment, or even if it's a you know a different region, captures it and writes it, is responsible for the promotion and apply. So when you hit that button that says fill over or test, the ZCA then has to scramble, get all the data, create the VMs, apply the data, and get it all running. And that can be a waiting game in cloud, especially with a lot of the restrictions. By moving to scale sets, what we allowed to do was those, those ZCA components can scale up immediately when, you, when that button is hit and then scale down. So maybe for a period of 15 minutes, you're going to see dozens of these instances um, come up, do a lot of work, and then spin down. The net result, we found 300% improvement in RTO and cloud. So we started getting closer to that on-prem VM type experience when you're failing over uh, to cloud. And of course, with that came you know, newer technologies for clouds, being able to support managed disks, 
uh, being able to fail over between regions. So going from on-prem to cloud is great, but the moment you're on cloud and you're starting to run production in cloud, the question became, now I want that same service uh, uh, across regions. So we started supporting that as well in, in seven. Um, we also did announce support for Azure's uh, VMware service. So that's VMware running natively as a service within Azure. And this made it a lot simpler for, for those of our customers who don't want to have to manage and learn one uh, platform on one site, and when they fail over, it's a whole new set of skills on the other side. And uh, the biggest challenge for that one is uh, the available knowledge base out there and the skill set to be able to do that in a, on a daily basis. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're a large portion of our business is uh, managed service providers. And uh, in order to make their lives a lot easier, things such as single, v single VM support within our uh, VCD platform or um, integrating more API and billing so they could layer on their tools and their billing uh, components on top of Zerto and more effectively uh, bill their customers. Hey Deepak, this uh, is Christopher. Uh, I was curious if you're finding that uh, your customers or MSPs are using one cloud more over another or if there's you know certain benefits of one, one platform uh, to choose as that cloud platform versus another. You know, I think it's very much um, so. What I'm, what I've seen, at least to the the, the, the our larger ones that I've talked with, is that uh, they will have skill sets in multiple clouds. So, what, for example, one uh, service provider may be more heavily skilled because they'll have certified AWS uh, engineers on. Um, on site or on staff. And another one may be more heavily aligned with, uh, with Azure. But what I, I am seeing a shift in is you can come and use our facilities or, hey, if you want us to go to public cloud, we can still continue to manage it, um, uh, manage it in public cloud as though it were, you know, one of our data centers will manage your VPC or your VNets, et cetera. So I'm, I'm not seeing one more than the other. I think it's more uh, dependent on who, uh, who, who the MSP or the cloud service provider has aligned, which cloud they're more aligned to and where they have more skills. So Deepak, following up on that uh, point, quick question about MSPs and the value that they add on top of Zerto. One of the practical challenges, getting the data and the virtual machines and uh, the images up to the cloud is one thing, data synchronization, but operationally, Getting what I do on prem into a AWS native environment, VPC or whatever, yeah. doesn't look the same. So, is that the value that MSPs are bringing, or is Zerto helping with that challenge? So, it's uh, Keith. It's kind of half and half, or I should say, there's the, the component in each one. We're trying to make a lot of the underlying components easier. So the conversion of, of a VM format into cloud format, keeping it, keeping it updated, taking a VM, uh, VMX configuration and putting it into an Azure VM or, a, or an AWS um, instance type. And a lot of the mechanics that are involved at, at that uh, hardware, I'll say virtual level, if you will, um, where the MSPs are providing a lot of value is if a customer doesn't have uh, the skill sets on-prem. So for example, how do I set up my, a lot of my security? How do I set up my network? How do I set up my uh, firewall rules? How do I do my DNS failover? That's the layer where managed service providers are, are able to, to complete the picture. If I could just go back to that last line on the previous slide, yes. all about billing. Uh, one of the things is always a big question when it comes to disaster recovery planning and everything is with what you've got there, can you give me estimates of how much it's going to cost for me to uh, spin up my disaster recovery situation in a public cloud? So in seven, what we added was uh, the ability to, um, to size us in the cloud. So for example, how how much not only the Zerto components will, would be in terms of resources, just compute, memory, et cetera, storage, but also if you were moving a certain amount of VM environment into AWS or Azure, what those components would be. In eight, which again, I'm glad I had the, the cover slide, we're, we're actually uh, pulling in uh, cost metrics into that. So we're not trying to replace a turbonomics type of thing, but there is going to be uh, an ability where you can pull that out apply costing to it. Cool. All right. 
All right. Um, so we, we did announce, uh, so there's, a, there's another component of Zerto. This, every customer gets it uh, as part of their platform. And we've had you know, great adoption. And this is around our reporting and our analytics. What we do is uh, once a customer checks a, a box that says, yep, Zerto, please send, uh, send information up to the Zerto analytics, we're actually running this on a cloud. It's a, it's a uh, Gen 2 application running in a containerized environment. We're pulling in, uh, pulling in customer data and putting it through an analytics engine and then presenting that back to them. So they'll, they can log in and see data beyond what's in the local uh, Zerto instance on their site. And it'll also ag aggregate multiple, uh, multiple sites together. So it's a great reporting dashboard. Um, we added a new UI to that. We added some custom views if you wanted to see you know, what's been happening around uh, uh, for 90 days, for example. And then beyond that, um, we've, we've got uh, Swagger API integrated with that, and they can pull that into their favorite BI tool. So this is where we added the resource planner capability we, we question touched on earlier, where we can uh, uh, for, forecast on, on uh, requirements, compute storage, networking, et cetera, uh, both for on-prem and for cloud. And of course, the cost component you know, came in, um, was going to come in with our, our next release. And then we made this tool available not just for... Um, for our internal folks, um, SEs, et cetera, but also to our customers, MSPs, and uh, even uh, even prospects that can try it out and see what it, it would be like. And then a the, uh, the bigger shift in this is, yes, in cloud, you don't have to pay unless you're using it, but based on how the technologies are actually replicating the data, it starts becoming very important. So if you uh, you know, just last week, I had a, a question from a, a service provider that said, I'm moving 100 terabytes into Azure, what class of storage do we, do you need? Where do you store the data? Is it going to be page? Is it going to be GP1? And they're trying to drive that cost down looking at the Azure cost calculator. So those, the choices that we make in the underlying platform will ultimately you know, drive some of, those, uh, some of those costs. So what we've done with our platform is made that a lot simpler. So for example, we use you know, page blobs quite a bit. Um, things such as scale sets will keep costs down. So even though you're replicating a large environment, you don't have to worry about um, RTO until you hit the, the go button. Uh, so that, that's all kind of built into the platform. So th that's a, a quick update on on 7.0, 7 7.5. So all of all of last year, uh, our engineers and our folks been had been pretty busy, as you can see, kind of the, the drift where we're uh, evolving to. But also we, we noticed kind of a shift in how customers were utilizing Zerto, which was traditionally thought of as, hey, I'm gonna use Zerto for this, uh, for all my critical things, because it, it delivers a, a, a really tight SLA in terms of RPRTO. There's a, there's a specific set of applications that may, may only require that. That use case started expanding quite a bit. And I kind of bring back to the original concept of, let's remember the four things that customers want to do, which is one, I want to be able to restore data, data. Um, hopefully locally, preferably locally, but you know, remotely as well. I want to do DR, I want to keep stuff for long term, and I want to be able to move that across. So in the architecture that we, we um, start seeing out there, you could consider this a, a blueprint architecture or best practice architecture, and I'll break it down into a couple of components. Um, traditionally, what we're known for is we take, take the IOs that are being generated at the, at the production site and we move them over to the DR. DR infrastructure, we maintain a journal there, first in, first out kind of queue, and then we apply that to the DR infrastructure. If you hit the, the, the go button to fail over to test, we can go to pretty much any point in, the, in that journal on the secondary site. And if that doesn't work, then you can roll back to another site, roll back to another point, roll back to another point. So you've got the flexibility. One of the other features that we also have is the ability to go to multiple sites. You can go from one production to three different sites if you wanted to. One of those sites can actually be the local site itself. So what we saw kind of an uptick on was, was two things. One, customers replicating essentially to themselves locally, saying, why does my journal have to be remote? Um, we, have, we have one healthcare provider that uh, actually kept their journal remotely for seven days and started doing all of their recoveries from a, a VM and, and a, a micro standpoint so whatever is in the VM, whether it's be files or et cetera, out of that journal across the WAN. But some are not comfortable with that. So we started introducing this concept of operational recovery where we can keep the journal locally. Now, let me break that down a little bit. So I'm writing a copy essentially to myself on the, on the, on the production system. 
In most cases, those production systems today are deduplicated flash. So we don't have to worry about IOs and space as much as we used to worry about, you know, five, 10 years ago where dedupe and flash were just inching up from secondary storage to primary. Now pretty much every standard primary array you buy has some of those capabilities. So we write that on and it doesn't consume any, any additional storage capacity, it's identical data. And we also maintain the journal locally. And that journal, we're, we've got a, I'd say hard, but really a soft point where you can keep it for 30 days. Then when you ask customers, you know, what's your most uh, probability of restore window? In other words, where are most of your restores occurring and where does that, that ski slope drop off? And we're finding it's seven to 14 days. Um, so those that can and are adjusting their SLAs and their retention schedules are saying, you know, we're, we're maintaining seven to 14 days on-prem. And after that, we're pushing it off to cheap storage and preferably, you know, uh, somewhere on cloud storage. So this journal, local journal really started fulfilling that use case of operational recovery where a lot of status quo things get challenged. So first off, I don't need VADP, which means I don't need to introduce VM stuns into the environment. I'm continuously capturing the data, which means I can forgo the, I take a backup once a day point in time to, I've now got uh, points in time for the whole day sitting across, uh, let's say five second interval. Um, you know, that's how tight we're running. And I can restore those files. So it really started making customers question, why am I accepting 24 hour schedules or, or eight hour schedules for, for a lot of these, um, that's VMs and applications. And the second part is I can pull data straight out of the journal. I can recover an entire VM up to that point in time. And from there, we can then take it from the production side to the operational recovery journal and still push it out. So you, yeah, you may have a retention uh, that says I need to keep weekly stuff for a month and mo a monthly stuff for a year. Great, we'll push that off to long-term retention. It could be locally, it could be remote, just for simplicity of the, of the, of the diagram. And it kind of showed it as, uh, uh, as going to a secondary site. So that's operational recovery. DR, we're all familiar with, something happens to the production site, I hit a button, it fails over, I pick a journal point and, and uh, off, off I go, whether it's, it's a real disaster or a test, same kind of use case. And then same use case or technology is used for migration. And then the long-term retention is at the, at the bottom right where we're capturing data either from the operational recovery copy or from the DR copy or both and writing it to that low cost secondary storage. Again, with that retention policy of I'm, keep, I'm keeping it around to keep my regulators and my SLAs happy, but hopefully I don't have to ever recover from that. So make it as cheap and deep as possible. And we, we write that with long-term retention. So what we end up here with is all of the use cases that we traditionally think of in IT resilience um, covered under a single platform instead of uh, breaking it into multiples. So, um, and, I, and, and I, what, what I think is the, the biggest value here is the cost and efficiency, right? So for example, at the secondary site, you get, you don't have to maintain a like infrastructure. The way Zerto runs with its minimum journal and its minimum WAN, we're only transferring uh, scaled out changes that are compressed. We get the ability to maintain a minimal DR infrastructure, yet you still enjoy the RPO of, of seconds and minutes. From an operational recovery standpoint, it's a percentage of storage. Um, so out, out of the window go worrying about agents and having to sweep all of production on a daily basis, um, secondary storage, what dedupe ratios am I getting for secondary storage? All of that kind of goes out to, I, I add a percentage of storage, uh, storage to production, and I'm now essentially providing this capability of having our, our RPO and RTO of, uh, of seconds within the production site. And then the lastly, the, the long-term retention, which is essentially uh, being able to uh, keep it from for a long period of time. Uh, and then that's coming in at a, at a cost of whatever tertiary storage there is and a percentage of compute because something has to do the work. In our case, the same platform does the work. So I uh, want to give you an example of, uh, of a customer, 10, uh, 10Kate. I don't know if, uh, if you guys have heard of them. They make uh, protective fabric. So they make uh, firefighter uniforms. They supply uh, uniforms to the military as well. Um, they supply uh, fabrics for oil and gas. So anybody who's exposed to extreme temperatures, ex extreme um, environments, they supply the fabrics in order to keep them um, resilient. Not a company you would think would be an ideal target for ransomware attack, but they had a ransomware attack. And their, their traditional uh, approach before they were a Zerto customer was they back up, 
they back up to disk and they move it to tape and no, having the notion of, yeah, it's an air gapped copy because it's on tape. And an entire facility there got hit. They had about 12 hours of data loss and it took them two weeks to recover that. They became a Zerto customer and unfortunately they had another attack. With the way the Zerto rollback technology works in the journal, whether it was whether it's locally on 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 a remote site, they're able to use that journal to uh, roll back that environment within seconds. With, with I'm sorry, within minutes to seconds of loss. So there's their RPO and RTO. So we're seeing a huge uptick in these type of use cases, which is we're not going to have the traditional DR events of an, losing an entire data center, but there are a lot of micro disasters that happen from which we need to recover and. Um, some of the other use cases uh, of the IT resilience platform really come into play. So um, I'll- That architecture point, if I can just jump in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how would you apply the architecture for a place with a lot of small remote sites? Now, traditionally we have the product, big production data center, my disaster recovery and other hosted uh, colo somewhere or the cloud. If I have lots of little sites, can I use this same architecture with having local replica data and journal replica, which is autonomous in case I have to cut the WAN for obviously ransomware events? Exactly, yeah. So the, each of the, the multiple sites, so in, in this case, think of what's production site, which you're seeing up as production site would be one of those remote sites. And they could keep a local journal, and then the DR site could be the, the main site. And that's in fact how majority of our managed service providers run. They, they treat each of the individual sites as essentially tenants and they're coming into, into the core site, in which case they can fail over and run from, from, the, um, from the core site. So this, this, this would apply to a remote office backup type of solution or, or, a, or a many to one type architecture. And so in this case, the little robo sites would be sufficiently autonomous that if we chop their network, they can still use the local journal, they can exactly. run local restores and be able to yeah. get themselves back up and running. That's exactly it. Yep. You got it. Right. So let me fast forward back to where we were. So again, it's uh, kind of a, a single platform that is providing all of those, those use cases. And we, instead of thinking of it as um, you know, backup software or an archiving software or a, a software to make additional copies of data, it's all fitting in one, but we're sticking to our core uh, vision platform principles, which is we're capturing that IO stream once. And it's amazing what you can do with that data when you've got it in a journal and how many use cases um, you, can, you can create out of that. So that's, uh, it's core back to our platform. Now, um, two announcements um, that are, and you know, the timing of this is fortunate and unfortunate. Um, just in two weeks from now, we are announcing 8.0, which will have a ton of exciting features. I'm super excited about that. So there'll be, um, there'll be webinars for that one, uh, for sure. So I, I would urge everybody to, um, to attend that. And also, we are going to have our annual user conference, Zertocon, um, later on this year in May, we're all going to be making another exciting announcement and, uh, and that, at that venue and that location as well. Um, but what I'm more excited about is the guest speaker uh, here of mine since I was uh, in college, Kevin Mitnick. He's, uh, he's one of the, uh, he's our uh, uh, guest speaker over there. So I'm excited to uh, hear his talk. Uh, uh, plus, there's a, a platform that we've been working on near and dear to my heart, so I'm kind of holding back, not talking about it, uh, announcing it at, at Zertocon, which I think is going to be um, super exciting for, for the market. 